Hi you guys, Erin and baby Zoe here and welcome back or if it's your first time then welcome to Eat Move Rest. Hopefully you guys saw last week's video where Dusty and I and the kids sat down and introduced our newest family member and gave a little bit of a recap of our first home birth and our third birth in general. So this week I wanted to sit down again primarily because I still have a lot to say and it's Mother's Day weekend, so if that is something that you are excited to celebrate, then happy Mother's Day. Also, I'm just trying to really take it easy, so rather than running through the house, taking you through what I eat in a day and workouts and all the things, which I'm not currently doing, I'm really trying to embrace the slowdown. The first 40 days postpartum are so sacred and so critical to mom and baby's bonding, spending time slowing down as a family and just healing and recovering and repairing because honestly as good as you feel on the outside like i do myself there is a lot taking place internally so my midwife even said if you were to have the wound that is on the inside of your body from where the placenta detached visible on the outside on your leg, people would be gasping and staring at you if you were out in public or jogging or riding a bike. Same holds true for what is healing on the inside. So I always kind of say that this whole food, plant-based diet, healthy lifestyle is a blessing and a curse during this phase of life because I do feel so good and energized even after those sleep deprived nights where I'm up nursing, changing spit ups and poopy diapers. I still feel really good during the day and I'm so thankful to just taking care of myself and thankful to God for that. But at the same time, when you feel good, it's harder to slow down because you feel like, oh, I can do it. That's no problem. Um, so I'm just really trying to heed the wisdom and advice from my midwife and my doula to just enjoy the time because you only get this time postpartum, especially this first 40 days, like maybe only once in your life, you know? So this is my third time. It might be the last. I don't know. So I'm just really, really trying to embrace and enjoy the slowdown, like I said. So hopefully that will encourage those of you who are feeling the same, a little anxious about it, feeling like as a mom, you want to jump out of bed and get the kids dressed, brush their teeth, comb their hair. It can be really hard to just sit down, kick your feet up, and relax and enjoy the slow time. And I will say I was a little on edge a few days ago just because it was really grinding on me to not be able to pick up after the, the trails that the kids leave everywhere and having Dusty make the morning green smoothie that I so love preparing and little things like that. But I'm really learning to surrender to the process and surrender to being less in control and just riding the wave of life and it's been really wonderful. My mom just left. She was here over the weekend for two days, just a short and sweet stay because she plans on coming back in about two or three weeks with my dad and my nephew Isaiah, which of course Max and Liv are looking so forward to seeing their cousin. So that will be super fun. And Dusty's mom is coming into town in two days. So we've had a little bit of break in between, but the help has been much appreciated, much needed. So before we jump into the Q&A portion of this video, I wanted to share a very sensitive story with you guys, but it's also just really beautiful. Um, and kind of why this third birth was so extra special to Dusty and I, the entire pregnancy, really, truly. So my mom and Dusty's mom both miscarried with their third pregnancies. And I can remember as a little girl being so excited to have a baby brother or sister and kissing mom's belly every morning. And I do remember my mom being really heartbroken and devastated. And I remember her telling me that she held the tiny baby in her hands. And then I don't know the details of Dusty's mom and their story, but it's just interesting that they both had that same thing happen, wanting to have more kids. And I really, really was like, I just want to break that cycle. I want to bring a new blessing into the world to symbolize like, you know, we can make it past this. And so we went for baby number three. Zoe felt like oh, we've been waiting to use this name for so long. And I was like reading up on the meaning of the name and Zoe means life. And then I also was reading further into it. And biblically speaking, the name means eternal life. 
So I thought that was really beautiful and it just got me really thinking about my unborn baby brother or sister and Dusty's unborn baby brother or baby sister and how Zoe is a symbol of life but also thinking about eternal life and that someday Dusty and I will get to meet our siblings in heaven. So I just thought that was really beautiful and really cool. And then another very short um, story about Liv's name. Livy is really cool because Dusty's mom's name is Lisa and my mom's name is Vianne. So the first two letters, L-I, Lisa, and the last two, V-I, Vi, which my mom commonly goes by, Livy. I just think it's really cool that it has Dusty's mom's first two letters and my mom's first two letters. So happy Mother's Day to both of the moms if you are watching and I hope that these stories were kind of meaningful to you as well. So let's jump right into the Q&A. We've got some really common ones that I've been getting. A lot of people ask me how she's latching and how breastfeeding is going and if I'm doing tandem breastfeeding or how long I breastfeed. So with Max, I breastfed him for four and a half years, which some people frown upon. It's surprising. A lot of people frown upon breastfeeding in general here in the States, but everywhere else it's so common. There's no shame around exposing yourself to feed your child. Like when we go to Costa Rica and all of that, I just felt so much more carefree and open. Um, even right now, I mean, I don't think that there should be anything wrong with, you know, feeding my child right now <laughs> like I am. So I just want to encourage those of you who might feel judged to just embrace it. And for those of you who feel like maybe you want to judge, just to kind of put yourself in a mother's um, shoes. We're all different and I think you just have to do what's most comfortable for you and of course what's best for baby. So now I am tandem breastfeeding both Liv and Zoe. I think Liv has had a little bit more of a difficult time adjusting to our newest family member, especially when it comes to bedtime and she always wants to sleep next to me but the baby is nursing on that side or things like that and she's acted out a few times so I'm gonna really have to double down on the mommy and Viv time but for the most part like she has been so incredibly sweet and kind and such a good big sister and she's so good like just holding her and being super gentle and same with Max it has been the sweetest cutest thing and I'm like I thought we were done at three but seeing our older kids with the newborn makes me want more. It's like the most adorable heartwarming thing on the planet. So you just never know. So I did get a question on the health of my placenta and I took it to mean, do I think it's healthy to consume it? Which a lot of people do. Some people consume the actual placenta in like a stew or some kind of baked or cooked meal. But I would say the majority of people who consume it end up doing the encapsulation route where it is dried and then put into a powder and then into pills. And it's said that it can help with your healing and with postpartum and hormonal issues and um, postpartum depression and anxiety and blues and all that kind of stuff. That being said, I just feel intuitively very not drawn to consuming it. I did not with Max or with Liv. What we did was we kept the placenta and planted it under a tree in the yard. And it has actually been said that if you do that, that your child, if they're ever having like a difficult time, like number one, get them outside, but number two, bring them to the area where the placenta was planted. And it is actually supposed to give them kind of a calming, grounding um, shift in their energy. It can be very special a way to kind of have a place where you can go to have like a quiet moment to yourself too. I feel like because I was already doing so many other healthful things postpartum, I didn't have any issues with Max or with Liv with postpartum depression or anxiety, thankfully. I chalk a lot of it up to sleep and I'll get to that later when we talk about co-sleeping. But if it's something you're interested in, I would say to just do your own research because there is a lot of evidence showing that it can be beneficial, but there's also a lot of evidence showing that it could have a lot of waste in it and toxins that are built up and that it could actually do the opposite because of the hormones in it where it could actually exacerbate symptoms of depression or anxiety or worsen issues. So I would definitely look into it. There's pros and cons that I've read. So I think the other way that this health of my placenta question could have been taken is there was a very viral video that circulated on the internet a while back, I think it was a couple of years ago, showing a meat eaters 
or like an animal-based eater's placenta versus a vegan's placenta. And the person said that the vegan's placenta looked like a smoker's placenta. And everyone was up in arms saying, oh, you're being malnourished, you're malnourishing your child. Vegan pl vegans are so unhealthy, just look at the placenta. It's the perfect barometer of health because it's the only time we get to look at one of our organs outside of our body. So my midwife herself examined my placenta right in front of me. The photographer took a picture of it and video of it to document it. So maybe I can share those if it's not too graphic. Look away if you don't want to see it. If you do want to see it, great. But my midwife number one said it is a great indicator of future heart disease because of the tiny blood vessels and you can look at them and see if there are clots or anything like that. And because they're so small, if they're going to clot anywhere, it's going to be in those small vessels first and that can indicate future um, predisposition to clogged arteries in your heart down the road. So she analyzed mine and looked it over and said it is incredibly healthy. It was a deep, dark, rich red color. It was very big in size. Um, so it was just really interesting. Even Max and Liv were super interested and fascinated and they weren't grossed out. So again, it was a really great learning opportunity for them um, to just kind of dispel some of the myths around birth being gross or some kind of condition or being super medicalized where, you know, oh my gosh, something's wrong with mom, you know? So it was just really cool. You can definitely say, yes, there are two ways to be vegan. So maybe this vegan whose placenta they had obtained was a smoker, you know? Or maybe she was eating French fries and processed vegan junk food every day. You just don't know. But my midwife herself said the whole food plant-based eaters who babies she has birthed, those mothers always have the most robust and healthy and rich dark red placentas. So. For what it's worth, I feel okay. <laughs> so just touching on the home birth thing, I know a lot of you were caught by surprise or questioned why I chose to do a home birth coming from a family of doctors and saying I would never do a home birth and that I felt more safe in a hospital. So I absolutely felt safe in the hospital in Nebraska where I gave birth to both Max and Liv. It's somewhere I had grown up going as a child, visiting family members there, grandparents there, my dad working there and being on call there. I was never really like that afraid. The hospital back home was very accommodating to having a midwife and a doula come in and I did things naturally and drug free. They were very accommodating to my wishes like 100% of the way, so that was great. Being that we're in a new location here and also being about 30 minutes from the closest hospital and not having heard the greatest things about the hospitals in the area just kind of put me on edge and made me a little uneasy. So when I was on the search for a midwife, one was unresponsive. The other one was Kristen at LifeSong who I immediately hit it off with. We connected on so many levels and I said, would you be able to do my birth at the hospital? And she said she only does home births. Well, another thing about Nebraska is that they're basically taboo slash illegal. So I didn't ever feel like I wanted to look like or feel like a criminal for birthing my baby at home. So it's just something I never really had to entertain. But here being that it was just run of the mill and normal and she comes from three generations of midwives and she's just very wise and just felt almost like a mother figure to me. So I felt very safe and secure the more that I went in for checkups and visited and learned like all of the safety measures that they take and have when they come to your home and help you give birth. And I just became more and more fascinated and more and more inspired and motivated to do it this way because I knew that, that my labor with Max was very, very scary and difficult and stressful and painful when we drove to the hospital because things started to progress on the drive there. I didn't really ever get a grip on like harnessing the tools I had used with hypnobirthing and breath work. It all went out the window. And then with Liv, it was only a six hour labor and I made sure to get us to the hospital earlier that time and I felt a lot more in control but then I was like oh my gosh you know we're far from the hospitals here and it could be a three hour labor it could be cut in half again and sure enough it was so I'm just very very glad that we did things here because it helped it to feel more relaxed and I definitely felt my most confident this time around so I wasn't worried or anxious in the least bit. Another question I get is about sleeping and sleep deprivation and oh how do you look so energetic and bright and glowing days after giving birth 
And honestly, co-sleeping has been the route we have taken. That's another thing where there's no right or wrong between like having a nursery with a crib, with the monitors or the cameras or all of that stuff, if that's what you feel will help you best. But I do honestly feel like co-sleeping has saved us because we, when we had Max and we put him in his nursery, I was on pins and needles every night. Any creak or crack or baby sound would make me jolt awake and my heart was racing. I was just so anxious having him so far from me after, you know, not just for baby's sake, baby being inside of you, touching you for nine months, you know, I was kind of missing that bodily connection as well. So I just feel so much more safe and sound and secure having our newborns, our babies sleep with us. Another option is to have a bedside bassinet, which we did with Liv, and we did not end up using it very much at all, maybe for a couple of nights, and then naps here and there, which it was nice for, and it eventually became just a changing table, <laughs> essentially. We do have a Snuggle Me Organic and a Daca Tot, which are like these little like bumpered pillow beds for your infants. And that has been a lifesaver because then it kind of keeps you from, you know, if you're, if you're someone who tosses and turns, can really help you to feel more sound, safe and sound that you're not going to roll over onto baby. The thing is you want to make sure it's tugged up as high as your heads are, so above sheets, so that sheets can't cover your baby's head or face. What we've also done is I found a um, Twin XL organic mattress on Amazon. So I'm pointing this way because our bedroom's right here. And we've put it wedged between this wall and Dusty's side of the bed. So Max sleeps in there. Sometimes Dusty sleeps down there with him. Sometimes Liv sleeps in there. I might as well because it's like super cozy and comfy in this little nook. We've got our king size bed. Usually it's me, baby, Liv, Dusty and we've got plenty of space in there to spread out. Getting five of us in the bed would be a real challenge, but four is doable, usually it's three of us. So I highly recommend just doing what works best for you, but don't be afraid to co-sleep because honestly, like most of the feedings that I'm doing are dream feeds. So that's essentially where baby is still asleep and I'm half asleep and we're just in the side lying position and I can nurse her very easily that way and still feel rested without having to, you know, flip on a light switch and sneak into the nursery and sit up and rock in a chair and all of that stuff. I just feel like I've really attributed co-sleeping to the reason why I've been able to get really pretty solid sleep during the newborn days. So I had a question about when do I begin postnatal workouts? So going back to the first 40 days, I will be waiting it out. And my midwife's recommendation as far as starting to do walks, she said, wait till your bleeding has stopped completely for four to five days before starting to walk. Because as soon as your heart rate elevates and your blood pressure goes up, then the bleeding can start again. So it can go on, off, on, off for days. But the more that you are kind of exerting yourself, doing heavy lifting, things like that, the bleeding is just going to continue. Again, going back to that open wound on the inside, if you can visualize that and how much healing needs to take place, it can really help you. It doesn't mean all of a sudden at 40 days, you're ready to just hit the ground running. You also need to remember that when you're breastfeeding and you know there's just a different influx of hormones, your joints and your bones are still going to have a lot of that relaxin, which you need for childbirth. It relaxes and helps things to like be a little bit more loosey goosey, but it can also make you more prone to injury. So, I mean, low impact workouts, low resistance training workouts, um, even low cardio. One of the things that helped me was um, Nancy Anderson, who is certified and trained as a personal trainer and she specializes in um, prenatal and postpartum fitness. So she had some phenomenal prenatal workouts that you'll want to check out through her ab prehab app. So I did her ab prehab, which is basically a lot of breath work and just pelvic floor and core work to help engage those muscles. After you give birth, it can help prevent like leaking and help prevent diastasis recti, which is the ab separation that can happen. 
So then postpartum, she has ab rehab, and I would say that would be a great thing to kind of get into. You always have to kind of gauge what feels right to you also. I'll probably get into walking and then maybe some body resistance training without the weights to get started. Workouts off the bike, because I think sitting on a bike saddle doesn't sound like the greatest idea. I'll be sure to follow up and share a video with you guys at that point when I get there. So I'll read some of these to you to keep them short and sweet. This is a good one. Again, tips to prevent postpartum depression and anxiety. Anxiety. I want to thrive this time. Here was my response. I would say sleep is the most important. If it's feeling too interrupted at night, sleep when baby sleeps during the day. Co-sleeping has always helped me to not become sleep deprived. Also taking things slow will help. Don't overdo it or your nervous system will become stressed. Make sure to hyper nourish with lots of whole foods, stay super hydrated, and most importantly, ask for help when you need it. That's a big one. So it can be difficult for us mamas who want to do it all, like I said, to just simply sit back, bond with baby and ask for help because most people are ready and waiting. They just don't want to bother you during your sacred time. So they might be wanting to know how you're doing and wanting to help, but they don't want to bother you. So be sure to just reach out. When are you coming back to Nebraska to visit? We're hoping this summer to go back once or twice like we do almost every year. And we'll be sure to, of course, bring you guys along on that adventure. And I want to do some kind of like round table plant-based gathering. So that would be cool too. Best supports while in labor. I relied heavily on the Christian hypnobirthing app, which I've talked about a lot, um, and my breath. So just keeping it simple because there's a lot of bells and whistles and fluff that, you know, we're encouraged to include when it comes to like envisioning our birth. And it does make it seem very like Yes, this, this kind of relieves my nerves and anxiety, but am I actually going to do all these things? I don't know. So there's like essential oils and lights and music and a playlist. And yes, it's good to be prepared with those things. But in the back of my mind, I was like, I just want to focus on my breath and on the hypnobirthing visualizations. So just breath and visualization really got me through. So a really simple breathing technique you can look into is the J breath. And then another one is just inhale for four, exhale for seven. That's really what I've used with the past two and it has been a life saver. Also like making sounds. So there are sphincter muscles even in our breasts, if you can believe it. So when you get that letdown reflex and you start to leak milk when you're thinking about baby or when it's time to nurse, there are sphincter muscles that can sometimes allow that milk to leak out. There's also sphincter muscles for our bladder and our vagina and our anus and also our mouth. So when you think about opening your mouth and like low, deep sounds and breaths, when you open up here, it opens down there. So it can really help you to breathe baby out when you're doing low oohs and ahs and breaths. Things will just start to flow a lot better. So look into that as well. Other supports, a midwife and a doula. So a midwife is going to basically take the place of your doctor. A doula is someone who is there mainly for like the emotional support and to kind of coach you through these breathing techniques and like Ali for me applied like a lot of counter pressure to my hips when I was at the peak of a contraction. It's just easier for someone who has experienced their own births but also been in attendance for several other births to kind of know more so than your husband probably would like what a woman wants and needs when they're in labor especially too then it's someone that you can bark at or yell at or get mad at or saying no that's not helping me i don't want that without offending or hurting your husband or your child like it's better to just have someone else there who's like it's totally okay you can say whatever you need to say to me i'm here to get you through so i think that helped i've had some people ask why are you breastfeeding if you're vegan and it's just very bizarre to me because it, because it is the most human, instinctual, innate thing and the most nourishing thing for our children. So I say, not your mom, not your milk. So mother's milk from a cow is for a baby calf. It has an immense amount of hormones that our bodies aren't prepared to take in. So it can be hormone overload. But for a baby calf to grow from teeny tiny to thousands of pounds, it's designed for them. Same goes for us. Mother's milk is for newborn babies. Dog's milk is for puppies. We wouldn't drink dog's or cat's milk. Why are we drinking cow's milk? This was an interesting one that I never knew that 
people questioned. Until your breast milk arrived, what did you give the baby for the first 48 hours? So yes, our breasts are producing very minute amounts of liquid called colostrum or liquid gold during the first 48 hours. Your body will actually start producing it usually in the third trimester at some point. So it's preparing for baby. And when baby's born, the first 48 hours before your milk officially comes in, it's just colostrum. It's very golden, very minute, but baby's stomach is only the size of a grape. It's a nutrient powerhouse. I'm like, why have they not bottled this stuff yet? That seems like something the supplement industry would do. Lo and behold, now they're doing bovine colostrum. <laughs> Again, going back to why cows, we're not cows. Anyways, it's all that baby needs. Very normal and natural for baby to actually dip below their birth weight. And then within the first two weeks postpartum, they are supposed to regain and surpass their birth weight. So Liv actually regained and surpassed her birth weight within the first four days. And the first two days, you know, you might be worried, oh my gosh, there's not enough, but there is. And then when your milk comes in, you will know because you'll wake up one morning and you're gonna need a new bra, maybe a couple cup sizes. So if that's something you're looking forward to, then yay. So have no fear, your body is doing what it was designed to do and it's giving baby exactly what he or she needs in the proper amounts. How was your third birth compared to the other two? Here's what I said, short and sweet. They just got quicker and quicker each time. I feel like I wasn't really sure if it was the real deal this time because my contractions didn't really intensify until about one hour before Zoe was born. True story. Overall, I think the biggest shift has been just feeling more and more in control of my mind and breath and also being better able to listen to my body and follow its cues, especially during the pushing phase, essentially getting out of my own way to allow my body to do the work for me and just focus on breathing through the process. It really simplified things and made it a little less stressful each time. Very, very true story. So I did not push this time at all. So your baby's head, if they're head down in the optimal position for labor, then their head down and their face is facing in. The back of their head is, is right here in front. So when they come out, your body has this natural like ejection that comes from the uterus contracting and the fundus building and getting stronger at the top. And so it's gonna squeeze baby out. So when they start to come out, their head is gonna rotate sideways to fit properly into the pelvis because it's more wide this way. So they're gonna rotate this way. And then if you're pushing, 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 once the head comes out, trying to get baby out in one heave, you're probably going to tear because the shoulders are the opposite. So it's like a key going into a lock. It's gotta rotate once for the head and then you're gonna to have to give that baby time to rotate again so the shoulders can come out through the widest opening in your hips. So it's like a two step process. So this time I could really feel it. And yes, I felt the ring of fire, but no, I did not tear because I wasn't forcing and pushing. So that's another thing. If you can, if you can really listen to your body and follow your breath and allow things to happen, get out of your own way, you're gonna have a lot better success than if you have someone who gives you an epidural, you're numb from the waist down, you can't feel those bodily sensations, and then you have a doctor coaching you saying, push, 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 push. You could be pushing at the wrong time, and it's just working against your natural abilities. So just do your best to follow your body's cues. What do you think was the most helpful in preparing your body prior to conceiving? Um, I said, just getting really dialed in with all things eat, move, rest, eating an abundance of whole foods, staying active and getting adequate rest. Feeling like I hit my stride helped to condition my body and mind to be in an optimal place to conceive and stay quote on track during pregnancy. Have you guys talked about how many kids you will have, you know? I never thought we'd even have one. And then after one, I was like, I'm fine. That was tough. And you know, it was about 18 months postpartum. I became fertile again. And at the same time, I started having baby fever again. So yes, we ended up with two. And then after that, I was like, we've got a boy and a girl. That's pretty perfect. But again, same thing. I got baby fever and we had baby number three. And so we're not really gonna put a cap on things. Um, we're just gonna keep playing it by ear and see how we feel. Maybe we'll reach a phase in, in life where we feel like, yeah, you know, it's time to move on to the next phase of life, let our kids get older with us, start going on trips with them and growing old with them. 
but I just don't know. Have you found a difference based on the varying ages for each pregnancy and birth? And I said, no difference. Recovery has been the same, if not better each time. I truly feel like it's absurd that 35 plus is considered a geriatric pregnancy. Your biological age is more important than your actual age and diet and lifestyle will determine that. And I truly believe that. What did Biv think of birth? I remember her being very into baby dolls. So yes, Liv actually got to witness Zoe being born and I'm very surprised that she handled it with grace and she was just very fascinated, fascinated and inspired and I just think it's really cool to get to be that role model for her. Again, going back to reframing what birth looks like. So in the movies and in the media and in traditional healthcare, it's looked at as a medicalized condition and it's something like scary and painful and intense and stressful and it doesn't have to be that. It can be beautiful and just calm and controlled and carefree. So I'm really glad that she got to witness that because hopefully she can take that into her future if she ever has her own children. How to prepare for birth. Christian hypnobirthing app, and I say visualizing your ideal birth. So bringing in all five senses. What does it smell like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? And if you can really you know, get to a place where you're in a rhythm of visualizing what you want your life to look like, what you want your birth to look like, things can really come into fruition in a really beautiful way. Did Dusty catch the baby? Yes, he did. So I was on like all fours on the bed, did not make it to the birth pool, but he caught the baby and like handed her through to me. So it was like a perfect team effort and it was just really beautiful. So if I could distill it down to three things that truly helped me during pregnancy, childbirth and postpartum, it would be breath work, visualization, and faith. So faith is obviously number one, is just trusting in God's timing, trusting in God's plan, trusting that he will provide and that he will prepare and that he will give me peace. So that was first and foremost. And number two was really honing in on my vision for my ideal birth and also knowing and preparing my mind and saying something bad could happen. Yes, we can prepare for that, but let's place all of our focus on what we do want, not on what we don't want. So I had to shift my mind from saying, I just don't want to hemorrhage. I just don't want to miscarry. I just don't want to this or that. And this is something you can do for other scenarios, not just childbirth and pregnancy. So focusing, I just want a healthy, happy baby. I just want a peaceful birth. I just want a faith-filled birth. I just want, you know, what do you want? Focus on those things, visualize them through all five senses. And third and finally is our breath. So yes, of course, we want to eat healthy foods. We want to drink nourishing, hydrating, fresh, clean water. We want to move our bodies daily. We want to get good sleep. But outside of eat, move, rest, the most important thing that we oftentimes forget about is oxygen. We can't do any of those things without our breath. So if you can work on that belly breathing like newborn babies do, where you can see their belly rise and fall, really focusing on that, focusing on some of those patterns that I told you. You can look up all kinds of other patterns that can help you with anxiety, stress, depression, sleeplessness. Um, during childbirth, there's different breaths for different phases. Just, it's amazing. So breath, visualization, and faith. Hopefully that helps you guys. Hopefully you are encouraged and inspired or just entertained. If you are, give this video a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, join the Eat Move Rest family. If you're interested in hearing more from us on a weekly basis, be sure to jump in on our yearly membership, the Eat Move Rest Club. It is 75% off for life. So check it out in the link below. It includes instant access to our meal planner and recipe app with tons of whole food plant-based recipes. It includes our entire ebook collection and our private community where we're doing our weekly Zoom calls with coaching and Q and A's, troubleshooting, and monthly challenges. So super excited about it. You guys will definitely want to jump in on that. And if you have any more questions, be sure to reach out to me on Instagram at Erin Stanzik and Dusty at DB Stanzik. We reply to all of our DMs and we really love to connect with you guys there. So 
Until next time, eat, move, rest your best. We cannot wait to bring you more fun content. Hopefully we'll do something a little bit more vlog style next week. Bye guys.